Hey, quick reminder here, if we have a single charge Q, and we identify some point in space we call P, and we want to know what's the electric field at that point, if we say P is at a distance of R from the charge Q, and we know the electric field is KQ over R squared. Actually, that's just the magnitude of it. We also know how to solve for the electric potential at this point P. It's equal to KQ over R. But what if we have several different points? Well, then we use the superposition principle. Now let's assume all four of the charges here have the same magnitude, Q. And we're interested in both the electric field and the electric potential at the center of this square arrangement of charges. What I want to point out here is one of the key differences between electric field and electric potential. Well, we already see a difference in the equations. One is a vector equation. That's the full form for electric field. And the other um, is a scalar equation. One has a proportionality with distance that goes as an inverse squared relationship, whereas electric potential uh, just decreases as an inverse relationship. So anyway, mainly I want to point out in this lesson that electric field is a vector and electric potential is a scalar. Okay, so let's first of all find the electric field at the center. Because electric field is a vector, we should represent it with arrows. So let's uh, represent the electric field due to this highlighted charge. So that's a vector that's going to point down and to the right. If we say the distance from the charge to the center is A, then the magnitude of this vector is KQ over A squared. Okay, let's take a look at the electric field due to that charge. I think you know where this is leading. Let's look at the next charge. Oh, yeah. And the last charge. Right, right, right. What we get is four vectors that all have the same magnitude, and because of the geometry, they all cancel each other out, and then the net electric field at the center is zero. Okay, well, let's talk about electric potential at the center. So we can still say the distance here is A. The electric potential, due to this highlighted charge, has a magnitude KQ over A. And I don't represent that as a vector. That's just some amount, because this is a positive charge, that comes out of some positive value. So if I want to find out how much more electric potential there is because of this next highlighted charge, well, that's also, if I number these 1 and 2 and 3 and 4, V1, V2 is also positive, K, Q over A. In fact, that's what I'm going to get for V3 and V4 as well. And so to find the net electric potential, I just have to add all these up. So that's going to give me 4kq over a. So the net electric field is 0, but the net potential is most certainly not 0. What if we change the charges a little bit? So 2 are positive and 2 are negative. Can you figure what's the electric field and the electric potential in this case? So let's take them one by one. The electric field due to this negative charge, well, if it's a negative charge, then the electric field points toward the charge. This negative charge, yeah, there's enough symmetry in this arrangement that I think we're going to get another zero electric field. Let's see, I've got this third charge I just highlighted. So because that one's positive, the electric field from that one points away. And then the last one that I highlight also has an electric field. Uh, this looks again like the net electric field is equal to zero. Okay. Now what about electric potential? So the electric potential due to this charge is going to be negative kq over a. 
do this charge, it's going to be oops, positive kq over a. Let's see, this one gives us another positive kq over a. And the last one gives us another negative kq over a. So that positive and that negative cancel each other out. This positive, this negative cancel each other out. So both the electric field and the electric potential are zero in the second case. In the third case, again, we have two positive and two negatives, and we're going to find the electric field and the electric potential at the center. Well, I think you can agree that it doesn't matter exactly where I locate them if I have two positives and two negatives that the net electric potential will be zero. Now what about the electric field on this one? Well, it's a vector quantity, so we represent each individual charge's contribution to the overall net field as a vector. So we've got a vector down and to the right due to the first highlighted charge. Let's highlight another charge and look at its electric field. Okay, let's highlight a third charge. Uh, its electric field is going to point toward it, and the last one this way. Okay, and then each of those individually has a magnitude of kq over a squared. If we make an x and a y-axis, I think we can see from the symmetry of it that the net electric field on the x-axis is equal to zero. So the overall electric field is equivalent to the net electric field on the y-axis. So each one of these four vectors has a component pointing along the uh, y-axis. The angle here would be 45 degrees since this is a square. And so all four of them have the same component along the y-axis. So we can say this net electric field is for e naught y, so this is going to be 4 kq over a squared times the sine of 45 degrees. Anyway, most certainly uh, not equal to zero, right? Okay, so there's an example of the difference between electric field and electric potential in terms of one being a vector and one being a scalar for the case of discrete charges. Right? That's what we call, whenever we can point out each individual charge, one, two, three, four, we say we've got discrete charges. And sometimes we have a continuous distribution of charge. So in this case, a, a ring of charge. Well, we know the electric field at the center is going to be equal to zero for the same reason we just saw with these discrete charges. If I start dividing this up into a bunch of dqs, there's going to be a little bit of electric field dE, but I can always find a matching dq 180 degrees away that's going to cancel it out. Okay, then what if it's not a complete ring? What if I want to find the electric field at the center of curvature? but the ring doesn't go all the way around, so there's not a matching dq um, for every little slice I identify. So I slice the total charge q up into a bunch of these dq. I say the distance is capital R. Here I'm using capital R instead of lowercase r because it's not a variable. If I pick another little slice, a different dq, the distance is going to be the same value of r for all these. Anyway, let's just look at the first one I identified. So there's a little bit of electric field pointing this way. Now there will be another dq that's not 180 degrees away, but has symmetry about the y-axis so that its dE points down to the right instead of down to the left. So the point being the net electric field along the x-axis will be zero. So if we want to find the total electric field, we just need to find the net electric field along the y-axis. So let's forget this dq for a moment. And let's say the very first dq we have to account for starts at some angle theta naught. 
and we're going to have to divide this up until we get all the way over here. Actually, we could just do this. We could divide it up and say that's the first DQ we have to account for, that's the last one, and we'll stop at 90 degrees and then just double the result because the symmetry for this other half. Okay, so we're not interested in the total DE. We're only interested in the component of DE that lies along the y-axis, DE subscript y. So DE is K DQ over R squared. If this angle represents theta, so does this one. So DEY is DE sine theta. So our overall electric field is the sum of all the DEY which is therefore the sum of k dq over r squared times sine theta. We can replace dq with lambda ds. So the k and the lambda come out of the integral sign, and we're left with the integral of... Oh, and by the way, this lowercase r, I can really write as capital R. Everyone's at the same distance, so that also comes out of the integral. So k lambda over r squared, and then we're left with ds sine theta. Now if I'm interested in the arc length up to any angle theta, we know s is equal to theta r, so ds is equal to r d theta. So k lambda over r squared times the integral of r d theta sine theta. So now that r cancels with one of those. We've got k lambda over r times the integral of sine theta d theta as we go from theta naught to 90 degrees. Now the integral of sine gives us cosine, right? So we're going to have k lambda over r times cosine theta. And when we evaluate at 90 degrees, the cosine of 90 gives us 0. So our final result is just the electric field at the center is k lambda over r times cosine theta naught. And now I've shown exactly half of the circle. And in that case, it means theta naught is equal to 0 degrees. So this is the special case where E would just be k lambda over r. Oh, and by the way, you caught my mistake. This should be a 2, shouldn't it? Because uh, I only integrated up to 90, so I had to double the result because of the symmetry. Okay, so correct that mistake. We've got the 2, the 2, and the 2. All right. Well, that should have all been review anyway. What we want to point out here is electric potential now, right? So at the center of the circle, the electric potential is not zero, even though the electric field is. So let's see if we can figure it out. Let's start by solving for the electric potential in this case. Might help to draw the x and y axis in our first little dq is at an angle of theta naught, and if we identify some other dq, that's at an angle we'll just call theta. And so, due to this one, its contribution to the overall electric potential is k dq over r. So to get the total electric potential, I need to add it all up. And notice I'm not treating electric potential as a vector quantity. There's no components to break things into. There's no symmetry that says there's some sort of electric potential along the x-axis and potential along the y-axis. Electric potential does not have components on an axis because it's not a vector. So all we need to do is take the integral of k dq over r. The k and the r both come out of the integral sign, and we're left with the integral of dq. We really don't have to worry about limits of integration here at this point. It's just if we add up all the dq, 
and that just gives us the total charge, capital Q. Yeah, so the electric potential at the center is KQ over R. And so it won't matter whether it's exactly a perfect uh, half circle or a smaller uh, arc. So the total angle subtended by this bent rod does not change the result. The electric potential at the center of curvature is KQ over R. Okay, so hopefully that uh, helps exemplify this major difference between electric field and electric potential. One's a vector, one's a scalar. Make sure you keep that in mind as we proceed through the rest of this lesson.